action on the situation. Right now. The WFLA Department of News and Public Affairs presents the award-winning Ask the Expert. Ask the Expert, timely topics discussed in-depth with recognized authorities on the subjects under discussion. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Ask the Expert. I'm Roger Courtney, your host, and tonight we'll probe the field of meteorological prognostication. Now, hold on. In simpler terms, let's look at the weather. Our guests are Mr. Lawrence Dye, who is meteorologist in charge of the Weather Bureau, Mr. Bob Nichols, who is the principal assistant, Mr. Bruce Harvey, a radar specialist, and Mr. Paul Cato, who I'm sure you all know as the chief meteorologist for Channel 8 Television. Very nice to have all you gentlemen with me this evening. A couple hundred years ago, Ben Franklin said, some are weather-wise, some are otherwise. Of course, Mr. Franklin had quite a few uh, cute little phrases. And on that note, I think we'll have Larry Dye tell us a little something about the Tampa Weather Bureau and the fact that this is the 100th anniversary of forecasting. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, on behalf of the Weather Bureau, it's a pleasure to spend this hour with you and with the public to uh, let them know some of the things that we do. Uh, we have a rather relatively small force out here of only 20 men, and uh, we have a full observational program besides surface, and we have our upper air program, of which uh, many people see balloons uh, ascend, carrying radio sounds aloft at early in the morning or early in the evening, and uh, we have our large radar with its program that requires a force of five people, and uh, we have uh, a long coastline of 200 miles for forecasting uh, the sea conditions and the weather that will affect uh, the small boat operator in which we have to put up small craft warnings or storm warnings, whichever might occur, and that includes uh, uh, notifying 18 to 20 uh, displaymen along the coast to put the warnings up or to tink them down. We have 13 counties that extend from Levy County, which is Cedar Key, down to the other side of Sarasota, including Venice, and going over as far as Okeechobee and taking in Polk County. And uh, besides that, we have uh, three rivers, because we're a river uh, district office that we have to make forecasts for, for flooding purposes. However, we haven't had any floods here for several years. However. Last year, even though we didn't have a great lot of rain, really the Withacoochee River ran quite high most of the summer and through the fall. Uh, we couldn't do this without another network of observers. Therefore, with all the observers' networks that we have, it's a full-time job just to keep them operating. And plus all this, we have our local climatological program and our local forecasting program. Larry, could you give uh, our audience an idea how these uh, gentlemen are? By the way, are, are some of the employees there women? No, we don't have any women uh, uh, at the present time. We have had women a uh, good many years back, especially during the war. Uh, men, power shortage needed in the military caused us to use women. Uh, there are many stations that do have women. There's been a few stations that have had uh, women in charge of the offices. Uh, we do uh, cooperate with the Equal Employment Opportunity Act in which we employ uh, uh, people of, uh, well, lower educational ratings than what the our majority of our people have. Well, how do these employees work together now? Is there a, a system of interdependence in other words, how does one uh, co-work with the other in gathering information? Well, our observational uh, staff, they uh, uh, collect the observations, and of course they're transmitted on a network of teletypes, uh, while the uh, uh, forecasters in the office, he also uses that, that information, whether it's upper air information that the upper air man is doing, or, or whether it is radar observing, of which the... Uh, radar man is doing. If the radar uh, specialist uh, 
spots what we'll call a real uh, high-powered uh, thunderstorm that goes up to 50,000 feet. Uh, he'll inform the forecaster on duty that he's got a, a, a real uh, hot uh, thunderstorm out here and that uh, he's going to watch it real in, <coughs> intensely. And uh, then uh, if it looks uh, dangerous, well, we put out a uh, severe storm or a severe thunderstorm uh, warning. Teamwork is the key word. Uh, yes, it's used uh, all the way through. And of course, uh, during good days, we might say, like we had today, why the forecaster will uh, handle some climatological uh, work. Maybe some lawyer calls up and wants to know uh, what the weather was a month ago due to some accident or something. Uh, uh. Well, 1970 marks the 100th anniversary of <coughs> weather forecasting. How has it changed in that 100 years? Bob, you want to say I realize none of us were around at the time it started. Well, I certainly wasn't around at the time it started, but of course the network of stations was very sparse at that time. There were very few. Most of the forecasting was actually done by single station analysis, which is just the same as the farmer who goes out and looks at the sky and watches the clouds and decides from today's weather in relation to yesterday's weather what he thinks tomorrow will be. Starting out with a beginning like that and with the advent of the telegraph relay of information from distant points which made possible the collection of data to uh, form a map which was had some currency could be made the same day as the reports were gathered, whereas earlier it had been necessary to relay information by the mails. Up to the present day, when we have a teletype system right within our own station, we can collect all the data in our own station. However, with the centralization, it has been found expedient to collect all the data in a National Meteorological Center at Sutton, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C., where all of the analysis, the first of all, the collection of the reports, the plotting of the charts, the analysis of these charts by uh, meteorologists, and then the preparation of prognostic charts is done within the National Meteorological Center. We are, of course, the beneficiaries of the work which is being done there since we ha also have a facsimile circuit where we receive facsimile charts, plotted and analyzed charts at the rate of a map 18 inches wide at one inch per minute coming over the wire to us. So that in the time that it, would that it used to take us to only plot a sectional chart for the southeastern United States, we now have off the facsimile machine a chart for all of the United States, Mexico, the Caribbean, and portions of Canada in that same amount of time. Of course, uh, yes, Roger, we might say also mm -hmm. that probably a fourth of these maps that we get, we can get 108 a day, are plotted and analyzed uh, by uh, computers. Uh, much of the uh, observational work is taken care of uh, on uh, that goes into the maps is handled by computers, which uh, is a great uh, savings of manpower also. And of course, uh, with the five different teletype circuits that we have coming into our office, uh, uh, the majority of that same information uh, is collected all over the United States uh, by the Weather Bureau and transmitted on uh, uh, aviation lines, federal aviation lines, and uh, that's available to television stations as well, so that they have the same data that we have to use, and uh, their services are not paid to the Weather Bureau. They're merely renting the machines in order for them to get it. Mm -hmm. Well, is it not true that because there is a closely woven network of all the different Weather Bureaus across the country, this makes it logically easier to make a local forecast because you have all this surrounding uh, information or data. Very much so. Uh, we couldn't do a job that we do today without uh, all the data that we get uh, from all our other surrounding uh, stations. Now Bruce, uh, 
You, the radar specialist, tell us what happened since the advent of uh, radar and prognostication. Well, radar was set up primarily to um, <coughs> follow the uh, hurricanes through the Gulf and through the Atlantic. And, um, of course, there has been a vast improvement in our service with the um, advent of the radar. Our radar uh, became official here in Tampa, our large radar, in uh, November 18th, 1960, right after Donna. Donna, you know, came through in October, September 1960. And uh, it was not, uh, as far as Tampa was concerned, it was not a real uh, big uh, hurricane, but as far as Florida was concerned, it was one of the worst because it went up through the fruit belt. And uh, like uh, Bruce just said, uh, it's uh, excellent for following uh, hurricanes, and we've used it uh, expanding on that with severe uh, storms, especially severe thunderstorms. And uh, our uh, thunderstorms down here are different than they are in the Midwest. Uh, uh, they go much higher, uh, which is, uh, as uh, we can see, due to the atmosphere here being different than it is up there. And uh, therefore, if uh, they got a thunderstorm up in the Midwest of 55,000, why, they'd really think they had a tiger by the tail. But uh, we might get one down here that not, might not be too bad. Although, if that gets up around 48,000, we think we have a pretty severe thunderstorm. And of course, down here in the <coughs> peninsula of Florida, it's so much more difficult to forecast movements of these storms. And this is where radar is of a great benefit. Now, how does radar relate to the ESA satellite? Radar must be more accurate, of course, in tracking the movements, say, of hurricanes, but uh, what role does the satellite play, would you say, Bruce? Now, I'm not uh, an expert at all on the satellite. Uh, the radar has a very uh, small and definite location where the satellite just gives a large picture over a huge area. And of course, by looking at a satellite picture, you can't, you can't tell the, the movement of the system by the different cloud swarms and formations. Can you really? Uh, you'd have to have the <coughs> pictures uh, by the hour or more than what would come to the normal stations such as we have or any of the normal readout stations except the two master readout stations. And uh, if you had theirs, then you can see movement by taking a time-lapse camera pictures and uh, uh, pasting them all together and then <coughs> running them off. You can see movement on it. Uh, but uh, for small areas, uh, you wouldn't detect it. Uh, while with radar, uh, Bruce can uh, uh, outline the thunderstorm uh, on the, an overlay and uh, the 15 minutes later outline it again or a half hour later and put in his time element and he'll know which way it's moving, how fast it's moving, and uh, which part of the thunderstorm is building, and uh, how much rain is coming out of it, whether there's hail in it or not. And of course, uh, if it reaches the hail stage, why we'll naturally know that it's got quite a little wind with it, and that in turn uh, can cause it to be a severe thunderstorm. Along with that, we have to note that uh, all thunderstorms can be a potential tornado, but Probably it's only one out of a million or some fantastic big figure like that that uh, really becomes a tornado from thunderstorms. Now, radar information is supplemented with other things like change in pressure and perhaps wind direction, and all these things together eventually end up to a, a forecast. Is this right? Well, yes, they're all um, used simultaneously. Now, of course, weather is on almost everybody's mind. Nobody seems to do anything about it, as the old saying goes. A lot of people complain about it. Uh, I know WFLA television has quite a good coverage on the weather, and we'll be talking to Paul in a minute. I <coughs> would like to say that WFLA radio carries as a public service three times daily reports directly from the Weather Bureau at 7.45 and 11.45 a.m., and again at 4.45 p.m. to keep the listening audience fully aware of the latest conditions. Now, as far as Channel 8's weather operation, Paul, you're the expert on that. I don't know if I'm an expert on it or not, Roger, but uh, we could not survive. We could not even begin to make a weather report if it were not for the Weather Bureau. These three gentlemen here tonight 
Bruce, Bob, and Larry, all the Weather Bureau, could be considered, I guess, the unsung heroes of the flamboyant weather cast that you see on so many of the television stations today because of all the information that we receive is handed down to us from them. They actually, actually collect and disseminate this information to us, which we use, put together ourselves, prepare a television program or a radio program, and in short, we disseminate it out to the public. We try to make it as simple as we possibly can, but we get all the technical information, of course, from the Weather Bureau, and we just uh, couldn't make, begin to make a weather report without them. So what you do, as technical as it may come from the Weather Bureau, you then transform that into the, say, layman's terms, we try to, yes. It doesn't always come out that way, but we try to make it as simple as possible and to put on a good, accurate weather report. Of course, okay. weather is not simple in itself. I might add to uh, what Paul said <coughs> there that uh, the Weather Bureau couldn't operate either without the news media uh, because <coughs> our product, we can turn out a forecast with all the aids that we have, but if it merely stays on the desk, it isn't any good. It's got to reach the public, and the best way to reach the public is through television, radio, and the press. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, one can't get along without the other. We have to get it across. Well, fortunately, there's a good rapport between the two. Uh, very much so. Uh, we are very happy to work along with uh, television stations and radio stations. Bruce uh, was quite modest when he was talking about the radar. Uh, all of us can remember Gladys, which is only two years old in 68 set offshore here and it's uh, through radar that uh, you could detect the movement when it changed courses from going north to the northeast rather and uh, uh, the movement on uh, hurricanes uh, are real uh, is real live on radar you can readily see it and uh, detect it and travel with it and, and so forth uh, of course we go back and we look at Donna as being the uh, probably the worst that uh, struck the Florida area in the recent years. And uh, then in 66, we had Alma that was offshore, a little farther offshore than Gladys, and then went on up to around Apalachicola or Cedar Key. And uh, then uh, last year, we had uh, Lori that came up into the Gulf, turned around and went back. Yeah. Was that the one that did uh, a couple of loop-de-loops? Uh, we weren't quite sure where it was going. Uh, yes, uh, it did, but I believe uh, it was um, Martha that uh, uh, did uh, cross its path three times, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and uh, that which was abnormal. Uh, Lori is the one, that, no, it wasn't Lori, uh, Kara, I guess, is the one that died over warm water, which normally doesn't happen. And of course, this year we had Elma again. Uh, hurricane names are made up for four years at a time. Therefore, and they're repeated every four years, except the most severe, such as Camille last year. And uh, it has been put to one side for study and it'll never be used again for name. There's a few names that have been extracted and never be used again. The ones that were real tragedies yeah. and real disasters yeah. would never be used. Well, we know this is the hurricane season that started officially on June the 1st. However, Alma seemed to want to get a head start on uh, everybody. I understand it was only the second one in this century that actually formed in the month of May. Now, what, what would cause something like this? Is this something that's as unpredictable as the fact that we name them after women? What would cause a storm system or a low-pressure area to suddenly decide to become a hurricane before we say it's really the season? Well, out-of-season out of hurricanes uh, are not unknown since uh, hurricanes have been uh, detected in every month of the year. Even uh, Alice in January over the uh, Lesser Antilles in, what was that, 1954-55 in January. However, a full-fledged full-blown hurricane with it Alice died <coughs> short, shortly after after uh, it was named a hurricane but uh, an off-season hurricane mm -hmm. the Caribbean being exceptionally warm a good inflow of moisture 
the uh, change in the in the tropical atmosphere just that few days earlier than June the first uh, is what mm -hmm. ca is what caused it to happen this year. Well, if conditions are right, it, it could be any day <coughs> of the year, really. I'd like to throw in another subject here that <coughs> you might call it the Chamber of Commerce uh, weather, but uh, uh, I have in front of me a seawater temperature chart uh, showing what a seawater temperature is off Egmont Key. And uh, when the average temperature in January runs 61 degrees, and it, it warms up through the spring and into the summer to 85.6 by August, and then it cools off to 63.4. That is uh, real good uh, beach weather as far as temperature is concerned for all our northern friends, because I know up New York and on north it never gets that warm, even the best day. And uh, the lowest temperature that we've ever had recorded out there was 53 degrees. This is seawater. That's seawater temperature. Another thing that I think uh, the public might be interested in is uh, <clears throat> the number of hours during a winter season that uh, uh, the temperature is 40 degrees or below during the whole season. And uh, it varies, of course, because we had our cold winter of uh, 57, 58, and we had another one in 62 and 63. and. Uh, uh, 65 and 66 and 68 wasn't a warm winter either, but uh, it varies. Well, in 1953, we only had 18 hours through the whole year that the temperature was 40 degrees or below. 68, we had 245 hours. Now, that may sound like a big stretch of time, 245 hours, but after all, that's only 10 days. And that is uh, the most that I could find in this uh, 16 day period. It averages out to be 99 hours during the season, which is only four days if you could crowd it all at one time, but it'll generally run uh, maybe six or eight hours that its temperature is 40 degrees or below. Well, nobody, of course, will <coughs> dispute the, the great climate that we have in Florida. However, so many uh, persons, those who evidently have a weatherman background, one who recently retired in Sarasota, I can't think of the gentleman's name, uh, Bacon, 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 Mr. Yeah. Bacon, mm -hmm. uh, as one example, have claimed that for some reason, over a certain period of years, winters have slowly become less moderate in Florida, that they're actually getting cooler, that there are more cold fronts seem to, to hit down here in the peninsula section of the Gulf than used to. And of course, some people go so far as to blame the the space program and uh, a few other things like years ago they blamed the A-bomb explosions on affecting weather and so forth. What, what's your view on this way? Well, uh, it's, uh, I got a friend that's working on that in Tampa right now <laughs> and uh, he is of the opinion that uh, each winter is get, getting a few degrees uh, colder and uh, uh, I got some literature for him to read and study, and uh, taking it by five-year periods, he's going to take it by five-year periods and study it, our 80-year history, because we have it close to 80 years now of uh, good uh, data here in Tampa, and he's going to study it by five-year period. And there's lots of uh, discussions on it that through pollution, bringing in industry, and so on and so forth. And some say, well, that makes a greenhouse effect, but also some say it cuts off solar radiation. So if the sun, the heat from the sun doesn't get through, why it'll bounce off the top of this insulation <coughs> from pollution, polluted air. How polluted the air is, I don't know. I read in the paper today, I believe it was, that go out the other side of Brandon and see the beautiful sky. And so <laughs> I just don't know about that. That's sort of but, rubbing it in. Uh, we could look back at degree days and you'll find that there's such a variation in degree days that it'd be impossible to uh, note them. Now, as I said a while ago, the season 68 and 69, we had uh, 1,102 uh, degree days, which is the second coldest in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. As from degree days, now when we speak about a degree day, we talk about the highest temperature and the lowest temperature, such as 80 and 40. That would make 60 average 
when you subtract that from 65, which would give five degree days. But we could go back through the last few years and we find that we have 512 and 61, 62, 820 and 62, 63, and then 63 and 64 was another cold year of 890. And then the next year it wasn't bad at all, 546. But if we look at some of these northern cities, they were run up to, uh, well, a thousand a month. Of course, uh, it is true. Weather runs in cycles. It may run in certain <coughs> year cycles and so forth. We're going to have to take a station break right here. After station ID, we'll be back with more Ask the Expert. This is WFLA Radio 97 Tampa, serving Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, and the greater Sun Coast. <laughs> Pandolas, Franklin at Madison, downtown Tampa, creators of better dressed men for more appreciative ladies, presents Pandolas Business Spotlight. Today in the Business Spotlight, Mr. R. H. Meyer, plant manager of Continental Can Company, another man on the move with a progressive Tampa. R. H. Meyer in today's Business Spotlight from Pandolas, Franklin at Madison, downtown Tampa. Listen to the sounds of the sale of the year. Yes, it's Million Dollar Days. Beginning tomorrow, Greater Tampa's number one sale of the year swings into action for three big days of savings. Don't miss out. Be sure to get your share of the bargains during Million Dollar Days. Sponsored by the Merchants Association of Greater Tampa. Now back to WFLA 97's award-winning Ask the Expert. Here's your host, Roger Courtney. Welcome back to Ask the Expert. Tonight we're discussing the weather. Our guests are Mr. Lawrence Dye, meteorologist in charge of the Weather Bureau, Bob Nichols, principal assistant, Bruce Harvey, a radar specialist, and Paul Cato, the chief meteorologist for Channel 8. One correction here. Earlier I said, and it is true, that WFLA Radio brings you weather reports three times daily, 7.45 and 11.45 a.m. and 4.45 p.m., However, the reports do not originate from the Weather Bureau. They come from upstairs in the Channel 8 weather room. Is this right, Paul? Right, Roger. Right. Okay. So now, as I stand corrected, we shall continue with our show. We were speaking of degree days before the station <coughs> break. This brings to mind a lot of people wonder, what is the lowest temperature we've ever had, the highest? In other words, what, what has been the coldest and the hottest days? say in Tampa and then in Florida? Yeah, the coldest we've had in Tampa is 18, and that was in December of 1962. We had uh, two days. Uh, one was 18, I believe the other one was 19 or 21. And uh, out of those two days, we had 15 hours one day and 14 hours the other day that uh, the temperature was below freezing, freezing or below. And, uh, of course, that's when uh, we lost a lot of citrus as well as uh, the fruit, we lost a lot of trees. And uh, some people thought that, well, citrus is doomed for Florida, but uh, it's back stronger than ever. Well, Larry, on, on that point, do you have some idea, of course, you're not in the citrus industry, but how many consecutive hours below freezing do they consider before it becomes harmful to citrus? Uh, I believe uh, 26 or 28 degrees is uh, what they're consider as the lowest temperature and uh, I don't, I'm not certain do you know Bob is that in four hours I think it's three, or <laughs> three or four hours I believe it's not it's 28 not degrees long. or below for three or four hours will damage the fruit and th is this regardless of whether or not you take protection with smudge pots well and so uh, that's what talking about temperatures now you can think uh, smudge pot to protect the fruit or fans or water any way you want to protect it Mm -hmm. It's a matter of uh, seeing that the temperature doesn't uh, go that low. You could spend the whole evening on uh, a fruit frost as to when to start heating or when to start fans and or water and so on and so forth. And in that case, I'd recommend you get somebody from Lakeland uh, who are real experts on. Uh, we uh, we will. Frost. I might mention that on a future expert program, we'll have a representative from Lakeland to discuss uh, the citrus. Right now, Larry, continue with uh, what you were telling us about the record lows and highs. Well, the uh, highest we've ever had is 98, and that's occurred in June. Uh, we've had uh, 
oh, quite a few 98s, but uh, we've never gone any higher than 98. Uh, we average in the summertime uh, about, um, oh, 20 days uh, in August of uh, 90 degrees or higher, and uh, maybe 25 in June, 23 in July, somewhere along that, of 90 or higher. And most of it will run uh, 92 to 93. We have here what they might call a built-in uh, air conditioner, and that is that uh, uh, mid-afternoon we get uh, a shower somewhere in the vicinity, and the clouds that flow out from that shut off the sun, and uh, we get a cooling effect, which makes it uh, more pleasant in the evening. With the fact that we're surrounded on three sides by, by water, uh, regardless of perhaps the sea breeze that comes in, would that have some effect to to hold, say, the temperature is generally under the 100 degree mark? Uh, yes, it, it would uh, hold it under the 100 degree mark. Uh, many of our thunderstorms, well, the majority of them in the summertime, build up early in the east and flow, move on across to the west coast. And uh, you can go out along the west coast, clear water, or go out in the bay or on the gulf, and you'll never get a thunderstorm in the summertime because they'll all die out before they get that far. But uh, they've created enough clouds, and uh, the cooling also from the falling rain and the evaporation uh, helps build in this partial air conditioning. How about the average rainfall for the Tampa Bay? Our, the yearly average rainfall for Tampa Bay, of course, is 51.57 inches. But, um, and our monthly, our monthly averages of course, our, our merely averages over long periods, which uh, run from um, a low of, oh, one, just a little less than an inch and a half, one and 46 hundredths in November, up to the uh, largest normal precip, which is in July, of 8.62 inches. However, there have been years which far exceed any of these. We've had uh, months in which we've had uh, only a trace of precipitation. In other words, not even a measurable amount. For instance, in July of 1960, we had over 20 inches, 20.59 inches of, of precipitation in that one month. Well, this will bring up another interesting subject. We had, did you say 28 straight days without measurable rainfall in this last dry spell, Bob? That's right. We had 28 days from, from April 5th until the 4th of May. Then on the, on the um, 4th of May, we had five hundredths of an inch, but then no rain again until the 24th of May, when our rain really started. Well, so not count. <laughs> I want to say something about that rainfall on the 24th of May. The reason why we had so much rain is that was the uh, particular day that we planned our annual weatherman's picnic. So we had uh, about two and twenty hundredths inches of precipitation that uh, really broke the drought, and we had to move our picnic up underneath our carport. But most of us uh, did make the picnic. Um, Mr. Dye from the Weather Bureau, of course, he didn't make it, so I hold him responsible for most of that rain that broke the drought. Well, none of the weathermen present there did any rain dance, though, did they? I don't think any rain dances were done at the picnic since the rain had already begun, but I know of several disc jockeys here at WFLA that had been doing rain dances for quite some time, <laughs> so maybe they were responsible. Well, at any rate, we, we ended the dry spell, that's for sure, whoever is responsible. Uh, How, what about I, droughts? I did, wanna, I, did wanna men I did want to mention, though, that except for that one day, the, the 4th of May, it would have been 48 days. We had 48 days with only that 5 hundredths of an inch. And the longest spell that we have had without measurable precipitation was um, the period ending the 16th of May in 1967. This did not really constitute what you call a drought, though, right? Well, of course, it, it is a dry spell because 20 days without rain is, is considerable. And, and the month of, of April was far below normal. We only had uh, 49 hundredths of an inch of rain during April, 
whereas um, April's normal precipitation 285. is 285. Well, I mean, actually, what uh, what information is necessary to, to gather and, and actually say, well, we have had a drought? Certain conditions have to be necessary, length of days, uh, amount of precipitation that you're already below normal before a dry spell begins? I, I believe that would be fair to say that all those conditions are necessary. I mean, right now, for instance, although uh, we had uh, far below normal in, in April, uh, starting back in October of 69, we've had uh, six consecutive months of above normal, and again in May we were above normal, so that even now for the uh, year, for this calendar year, we're almost three and a half inches above normal. So in spite of our 28 days in a row without rain, why we're still above normal for the year. Let's get back to this fascinating subject of storms <coughs> that are so prevalent in, in Florida as we know it. A thunderstorm, uh, what is the actual definition of a thunderstorm? Uh, Bruce, you want to tackle that one? Well, that would be just where the lightning is and you hear thunder. <laughs> That's the easy way out. That's the easy way. Actually, what conditions are necessary to perhaps bring on a tornado from a thunder? A tornado is really part of a thunderstorm. Is this not right? Uh, the severe tornadoes all come from thunderstorms. There are small ones, which are just small twisters. We've got a trailer, say. But uh, these are rare. Well, I know a lot of people would like uh, an idea of how they could detect conditions that might possibly produce a tornado, not only for their own safety, but perhaps to contact the Weather Bureau or law enforcement to forewarn the public in general. Larry? <coughs> well, when we, uh, conditions are such that uh, it's possible to have a tornado, uh, we have an office in Kansas City that has the responsibility of issuing a tornado watch, which means to watch for a condition, for a tornado that it might occur doesn't say that it will occur, but it, it uh, divides it up to certain areas, generally uh, 120 miles by 240 miles, uh, such as that. Now, what a person can do while they're watching is they'll see maybe clear skies and so forth, and they may see a thunderstorm develop. And for their, um, themselves, the best way for them to know whether a tornado is going to occur, if they want to do any self-prognosticating, would be if they get hail, <coughs> you're more than likely will have to have hail before you get a tornado because that hail results from terrific turbulence. And if they get hail, then they might say, well, we're going to have a tornado. But they might not have a tornado either. Mm -hmm. So there they would be a lot of guesswork if they'd say, well, we're going to get a tornado because we got hail. Well, it, hail is produced now, is this by raindrops that are because of the turbulent wind uh, that carry pressures that carries these drops up in their high field. altitudes and so on. That's right. They're carried aloft, and as they g go aloft, the big gusts that are carrying these raindrops aloft, they freeze, and when they're on the way up, they, they're super cool water, and they freeze more on it as they go along and become regular chunks of ice. Now, it may vary according to the intensity of the updraft. And of course, they stop rising when they over gravity mm -hmm. overcomes. Then they'll fall. Well, they may go fall a ways and they get down and they may melt some and then hit another updraft and go back up again. <coughs> That's why in the Midwest, they'll get uh, uh, hailstones, big as golf balls, maybe like the size of a two by four, six, eight inches long, all kinds of shapes because of the terrific updrafts they have. I've never seen any down here that size. Maybe they have them walnut size down here, but <clears throat> the best way to detect when they see a tornado or a funnel cloud is that they'll see circular motion and they'll be more or less a smooth edge. And we in the Weather Bureau like to be notified that we prefer they call their nearest law enforcement agency because it's easier to call them than it is to try to call us. We can get the word from the law enforcement agency through civil defense quite easily. But the things we'd like to know is that 
A tornado has been seen. It's only a tornado if it touches the ground. If it's still up in the air, it's not a tornado. It's a funnel cloud. If it touches the ground, we want to know where it is in relationship to a known mark, whether it's Ruskin, Sarasota, uh, Brooksville, wherever it might be, so many miles, and what direction it's moving. Now, the, uh, to better define this hurric or hurricane, well, this would apply for hurricanes, too. A tornado watch is where a tornado is not in existence, but conditions are favorable for a tornado. A tornado warning is issued for areas that are in the path of one which has been officially cited. That is correct. That is correct. Now, there's uh, notifications as to what to do in case of a tornado. They've been published and. If you're along the highway, well, get out of your car and lay in a ditch. If you're in a house, why well, open the windows on the lee side and crawl under the heaviest table you can get or take shelter in the, the nearest side of the storms coming from so everything blows over you. There are miscellaneous <coughs> things that people can do once if they're in the path of the tornado. Go at right angles to get out of the way if you can. And, uh, there's also, along with that, we have what we call Skywarn. Uh, we have issued uh, to uh, our network of observers, which is a cooperative network with uh, Channel 13, a uh, little symbol that says <coughs> Skywarn. And that's an organization of uh, what we call Weather Bureau spotters that will, in turn, return to us information when they see these are volunteers just volunteers. average citizens that uh, want to do a yes. civic duty and, and help spot That's these right. things and information yes. uh, Bruce what about radar mm -hmm. the importance of radar with tornadoes radar can definitely track their movements right well yes we track uh, the of course the path of the uh, thunderstorm itself and um, quite often we can spot what uh, may be the little speck which would be the tornado and we can follow it very easily. Now, is that how it shows up on radar? Does it show as a speck, uh, well, yes. like a P, or what? It, it would be um, the most intense part of the, of the thunderstorm, and we can uh, reduce the power of the radar and knock out most of the thunderstorm. And then this uh, little area that remains, which we would suspect as a tornado, we follow it. Well, we've touched on <coughs> quite a few things here so far this evening. We have a few minutes left. The idea of cold fronts and warm fronts, low pressure systems and high pressure systems. Bob, this is yours. <coughs> Tell us about cold and warm fronts and occluded fronts. This is one some people probably have never heard of. Of course, the um, polar front theory is the result of the studies by the Scandinavian meteorologists who determined that the best approximation to the actual uh, motions of the atmosphere could be shown by a frontal system which showed a warm front at the foreside of a wave moving along as you would uh, throw a wave along a rope tied to a post. And the front edge of that wave going down the rope is like a warm front in which warm air is replacing cold air at the surface of the earth. Then the, the second part of the wave, the uh, portion to the, as, as it is on a weather map to the west, would be the cold front where we would have cold air replacing warm air at the surface. Now this wave in actual practice in, the, in weather analysis shows up, becomes more and more unstable. In other words, the area between the cold front and the warm front becomes smaller and smaller so that as the, because as a general rule the cold front is moving faster than the warm front and as the cold front overtakes the warm front and lifts it aloft we get the occluded front which is the warm front being picked up by the cold front. This may or may not produce precipitation or cloudiness. As a general rule, of course, the widespread stable cloudiness, steady rain or drizzle is a feature of the warm front precipitation, whereas the cold front precipitation, the cold front is steeper, in other words, that is more 
nearly vertical than the warm front, and it moves air aloft very rapidly so that your lines of thunderstorms are more likely along the cold front than they are along the warm front. Uh, in the minute we have left, uh, frontal systems are actually only associated with a low pressure system? The low pressure system, the front as normally lies in a trough of low pressure between high pressure cells. The high pressure normally is fair weather and it is the high pressure cells which move the fronts. And uh, air currents around low pressure systems are counterclockwise, around high pressure they go clockwise. That's correct. Well, this may clear up some doubts that people had in their minds. So when you have a long period of fair weather, you can be sure you're under a, the dominance of a high pressure system or uh, perhaps a low pressure system that's high on the barometer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would rather say on high pressure when we have a, an extended period of fair weather. We've had a long discussion this evening, and I'm afraid we are completely out of time. We've been speaking about the weather naturally. We've had Mr. Lawrence Dye, meteorologist in charge of the Weather Bureau, Bob Nichols, principal assistant, Bruce Harvey, radar specialist, and Mr. Paul Cato, our own chief meteorologist for Channel 8. And I thank all you gentlemen for being with us. Roger Courtney, good evening for Ask the Expert. This has been the award-winning Ask the Expert, a feature of the WFLA Department of News and Public Affairs. The opinions expressed on Ask the Expert do not necessarily reflect those of the management of WFLA Radio. Join us Monday through Friday nights at 8.05 for an in-depth discussion of the topics of our time on Ask the Expert. NBC Radio News, brought to you by Pennzoil, the asked-for motor oil. Pennzoil, the pure Pennsylvania oil, contains Z7 and needs no other additive.